be seated. It's good to see all of you here this evening. It is my special delight to be able to introduce our speaker for this evening. Many of you will know uh, Jeremy's name. Pastor uh, Jeremy Walker is an individual who we pray for much in his church as well. Uh, Jeremy has been pastoring the Maiden Bower Baptist Church in Crawley, England uh, for around 20 years. Uh, some of you will know his father, Austin Walker, who was there uh, for many years before Jeremy. They did get to uh, pastor together for many years, but Jeremy there is now the sole elder of the church with uh, two other deacons, and we're very grateful for uh, his labors there and uh, the labors of all that uh, work for the cause of Jesus' grace there in that area. Uh, many of you will also know that uh, Jeremy and I have been friends for many years. In fact, we uh, wrote our first book together 13 years ago, and that was a real delight for me at least. I'm not so sure for Jeremy himself, but our brother was able to bear with me. And it's just been a delight to see the Lord use Jeremy, uh, not only there in England, but really around the world through his preaching ministry and also his writing ministry. So brother, we're delighted to have you. So grateful that you would come and preach at our church. And so come tonight and bring God's word to us. Such a delight to see you. Thank you for your warm welcome. Uh, do bring the greetings of God's people at Maidenbower Baptist Church, uh, south of London in the UK. It's uh, good to be able to be with you this evening. Would you take God's word, please, and turn with me to the 73rd Psalm. Psalm 73. I'm going to read the entirety of the psalm so that we have the context of what we're looking at this evening. It's described simply as a psalm of Asaph. Truly God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no pangs in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride serves as their necklace. Violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge with abundance. They have more than heart could wish. They scoff and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walks through the earth. Therefore his people return here, and waters of a full cup are drained by them. And they say, How does God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly, who are always at ease. They increase in riches. Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain, and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning. <clears throat> if I had said, I will speak thus, behold, I would have been untrue to the generation of your children. When I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their end. Surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. Oh, how they are brought to desolation, as in a moment. They are utterly consumed with terrors. As a dream when one awakes, so, Lord, when you awake, you shall despise their image. Thus my heart was grieved, and I was vexed in my mind. I was so foolish and ignorant, I was like a beast before you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold me by my right hand. You will guide me with your counsel and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart fail, 
but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For indeed, those who are far from you shall perish. You have destroyed all those who desert you for harlotry. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all your works. Let's briefly seek God's face once more. Lord God, will you indeed bring before our eyes tonight something of the end of things created that we may take with Asaph the long view and learn what he needed to learn that he might navigate this world righteously and humbly and even joyfully. Lord God, will you instruct us then from your word? Will you help us by your spirit to understand and respond righteously to it? For we ask these mercies through Christ Jesus alone. Amen. Amen. Who do you want to be like? Why do you want to be like them? I suppose that's a, a softer way of asking the question, who do you envy? <laughs> Who's got what you want? Who stands where you would like to stand? Who has the position or the pleasure that you would like to have given the opportunity? Where does disgruntlement and discontent creep into your thinking as you look around the church, as you look down the street, as you watch on the screen or read on a, a paper, media of some kind, when others seem to have an easy life, or at least an easier life, and you're tempted to think that's not right, and that's not fair. Why do they seem to get everything that they wish for, and I'm left in the circumstances that I'm in? Now, many people, and perhaps we know what it's like, despite what we say, and despite what we, we even mean when we say it, we might still aspire to the lifestyles of the rich and of the famous. Perhaps we even spiritualize it. We, we tell ourselves what we could do if we had that kind of platform, if we had that kind of wealth. And the fame and the fortune that people have, we tell ourselves that, that that's going to solve our problems, that that's going to deal with our issues. The peace that we would have if we were in this or that situation, the pleasures we could enjoy, the beauty that others have got that we don't see when we look in the mirror, the love or at least the adulation and celebration that others seem to enjoy. And perhaps what makes it worse is that it can feel like truth and justice have been altogether forgotten. Righteousness seems to be pointless. No one cares for it. It, it. it qualifies for nothing. It's got no traction. It doesn't gain anything. It, it's got no weight in the world. And it can seem as if the things that we seek to be and to do are pointless. There's no value to them. They're of no use to us. No one really has any time for them. They carry no weight. They bring no force if only we could be like somebody else, everything would be better. If you've ever felt like that, if you feel like that now, if there's at least some corner of your mind or your heart that is tempted to think and feel like that, then you've got at least some sense of what Asaph was feeling like and thinking like when he wrote the 73rd Psalm, or at least what he had been thinking and feeling like before he wrote the 73rd Psalm. What was the problem that Asaph had? Fundamentally, it was skewed vision. As this man looked at the world, things had become blurred and everything was out of perspective. He was like a, a man who needed corrective lenses, but he'd taken off his spectacles for the time being. Asaph had begun measuring by the wrong line and therefore, of course, he was getting the wrong measure. He was weighing on the wrong scales. He was counting with the wrong values. 
and therefore he was always getting the wrong answer. But it felt right. And actually there may even have been some kind of self-satisfaction in coming up with the wrong answer. And as you read through Psalm 73, and you, you look at Asaph, and he actually confesses toward the end that this is a carnal calculation, that he was thinking more like an animal than a man. But it is how he was thinking. And as he looked at the wealth that the, re the, the wicked enjoyed, it, he looked at the violence that they indulged, as he looked at the, the speech that poured forth from their lips, their disdain for the God of salvation, behold, these are the ungodly, and they're always at ease, and they increase in riches. And it's not fair, and it's not right, and it's not worth it. I have cleansed my hand, my heart in vain. I've washed my hands in innocence. All day long, I've been plagued. They're enjoying themselves. I'm trying hard. I'm doing a good job here. I'm checking off the boxes. I'm the righteous man. But I'm being chastened every morning. What's the point? What's the point of righteousness? Almost to the extent he's saying, what's the point of anything? You see, God has slipped out of Asaph's reckoning. He's dropped his eyes. And he's calculating purely on the world's terms. Eternity has drifted beyond his vision. He's seeing everything in close-up. And all he can see is this world. And that's relatively easy to do. And it's always painful to do. Because the world presses in, doesn't it? The world gets in your face. The world feels like it's the real thing and all that is real. It's the, the technicolour, surround, sound, demanding, invasive reality with which we have to deal. This is what is in your face, morning by morning, through the day, evening by evening. And despite what we say we know, and despite what we profess to know, we can be tempted especially when things become hard for us, to slip into the mindset that Asaph describes here. Brothers and sisters, and bear in mind Asaph is not an ungodly man. Brothers and sisters, are we tempted to feel like this? Has this become our problem? Is it your problem? Are you aware that it could become a problem. It doesn't take much to destabilize us, does it? A little more trouble than we'd anticipated, a shock that we hadn't seen coming, almost the definition of a shock, you don't see it coming, a, a building trouble that grinds us down by degrees. And We thought we were standing and we begin to slip. We can end up with something like the problem that Asaph had. And that's why we need to see, secondly, the place that Asaph entered. If I had said, I will speak thus, verse 15, behold, I would have been untrue to the generation of your children. When I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their end. This was what had begun to bubble up in Asaph's heart. This was what was about to spill out of his lips. And in the kindness of God, before he could make this his definitive declaration about life on earth, in the eyes of God, he went into the sanctuary of God. He says, I, I, you know, that's where I got to, and, I, and it was too painful for me to calculate like that. My heart was churned up within me. I was troubled, grieved, and distressed until I went into the sanctuary of God. This is the point at which Asaph, in effect, is able to turn away from everything that's been pressing in upon him, everything that's been dinning itself into his senses. It's been charging in through eye gate and ear gate and nose gate and mouth gate and feel gate. 
This is the point at which Asaph is able, at least in large measure, <clears throat> to put away, or at least to put at a distance, the incessant demands of this world and the, the cravings and the desires that can be so stirred up when it feels like all that we can see is what this world has to offer. This is the point at which the, the assertions of the world that are constantly being shouted into our ears, the assumptions of our culture and society that can seep into our thinking, the warning, for example, that Paul gives to the Romans, do not be conformed to this world. Asaph is saying, that was happening to me. That was the battle I was fighting. And I was fighting and I was losing until I went in to the sanctuary of God. You notice that what Asaph didn't need was just a bit of downtime or just a bit of me time. Asaph didn't go on a mindfulness course so that he could just step back a little bit and, uh, and learn some kind of meditative techniques that would just calm him down a little bit, that, that he would be able to breathe in a certain way and, uh, and work through some patterns of thought that would just take the edge off some of these agitations. Asaph doesn't need a psychological break. He needs more than a nice walk along the beach or a stroll through the hills or a climb to the mountains. Asaph needs to go into the holy place of God. And that's where he went. The sanctuary of God. Asaph went into the presence of of the living God. He drew near to God in the place where sacrifice is offered. And in dealing with God, he dealt with him who is altogether glorious. A God without beginning, a God without end. A Lord who is high and lifted up. There's a sense in which even the fact that Asaph cannot come into the, the presence of God immediately it is actually a blessing and a comfort to him because it reminds him of who God is and what God is like. Here is the holy, holy, holy God of Israel. His righteousness is, is written into every element of the fabric of the sanctuary. And you understand, it. You're, you're reading through Deuteronomy, You'd have read at times through Exodus that what the tabernacle was and what the temple was in their different forms, the one less permanent, the more intended to be so, that all of the, 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 the framework, all of the structure, all of the dimension, all of the furniture, all of the decoration, it's all telling you something about what the dwelling of God is like. It's a picture on earth of God in His majesty showing us where God dwells and what it takes to draw near to Him. And so everything about this place is saying to Asaph, God is righteous. God is glorious. God is majestic. Do you ever get a sense of the amount of gold that there was in the place? And the, 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 the size of the place and the beauty of the place and the colours of of the place and the blood of the place. You ever think how much blood was shed in the temple? What is that saying to Asaph? God is just. God is angry with the wicked every day. No man, no woman can approach God without the shedding of blood. For by the shedding of blood is the forgiveness of sins. The tabernacle, the sanctuary, tells Asaph that God is good. That the glory of the Lord is shining forth, for God has drawn near to man. The tabernacle tells us that God is true. The sanctuary tells us that there is something that is real beyond this present evil age. This is where heaven is foreshadowed. These are the types. These are the symbols these are the forms of a reality made without hands, which God in his mercy 
under the old covenant has stooped down in order that men might have some notion, accurate yet distant, of what it means to come to God. Here righteousness is revealed. Here infinity and eternity is at least sketched out with sufficient clarity and beauty that when Asaph comes into the sanctuary of God, things begin to make sense. This is where Asaph listens to what God himself has to say. This is where Asaph believes in the God of his salvation and his faith is clarified and purified and restored. This is where Asaph bows the knee to the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the God almighty who rules in the heaven and who does whatever he pleases. This is where Asaph worships the God who alone is worthy, a God glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, a God who does wonders. You cannot really know who God is without God's revelation of himself. God has made himself known in the sanctuary. You cannot understand how God speaks until he speaks by and from himself and he speaks to us in the imagery of these things you can't understand what God does you can't grasp what it means to come into his presence until you've come into the place where blood is shed and where the representative priest comes into the presence of God Almighty it is in the sanctuary that truth is pressed in to our souls it is in the sanctuary that peace is restored to our hearts. It is in the sanctuary where things shift in our sight. And we have a temple made without hands. We're not going to a tabernacle in the wilderness. We don't need a temple on earth. God could never be contained by these things. Solomon knew that when he made the temple. These are faint and feeble though accurate reflections and they have long since passed away how do you and I draw near to God we go by way of Christ into the heavenly places made without hands we can draw nearer to God by Christ than any Jew could under the Old Testament they were looking to him from a distance we have been brought near like those who then believed through the blood of the Lamb of God not just a lamb appointed by God but that one lamb where do we come to port before God to listen to what God has to say where do we come to have our faith clarified and purified where do we bow our heads in prayer where do we worship? What's the closest you get to heaven on earth? This is where we are. The gathering of the saints in the presence of God for the worship of the Lord. I'm not saying that there's no value at all in your private Bible readings, in your personal prayers. I'm not dismissing family worship or gatherings of the saints as friends to talk together and to read together and to talk, discuss and to pray. But it is on the Lord's day that God is pleased preeminently to make himself known. And it is where the Lord's word is preached that you will hear God speak through his ambassadors. And it is where God is worshipped by the saints in covenant together with him and with one another, that you will again see the truth of God's holiness, God's glory, God's majesty, God's righteousness, God's purity. It is among the Lord's people who together are seeking to see and to know and to hear what is good and true and wise and right. It is the experience of worship 
And by experience, I don't just mean the feel of it. I mean the, the, the whole package as your mind and your heart and your will are engaged. As your reason gets to grip with God. As your affections are taken up with God as he makes himself known in Christ Jesus, as your will is bound afresh to what God has said and lays a hold of what God has done to walk in the way of his commandments, that is the point at which we re-anchor. That is the, the weekly reset of our souls. Toward the end of the, the Bolton conference that was mentioned earlier, there were a, what for me were a surprising number of people. I, I understand the, the experience. I, I used to know a man who would go to a, a conference in the UK, which he, he absolutely loved. He went with friends every year. And he said, uh, he said this, this is a high point for me. But he said, I go home weeping every year because I know what I'm leaving behind. And I know that... I'll, I'll walk out on Monday morning and it's not going to feel like this anymore. And there were brothers and sisters who were saying, how do we maintain the things, the sense of reality that we've enjoyed over the course of the last couple of days? Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. And especially as you see the day approaching. My friends, the harder it gets, the more the world seems to triumph, the more the darkness seems to rise, the more the wicked seem to be in the ascendancy, all the more important it becomes to stir one another up to love and to good works, to speak together as the people of God and to remind one another of these things, to get ourselves under the word of the living God, to sing the praises of him who sits upon the throne and the lamb in the midst of the throne. How do we respond to the troubles in the world? How do we respond to the batterings of the world's assertions and assumptions? Where do you go? Better, to whom do you go? And it's not just to church. It is to God. You come to meet with the living Lord. And to come by way of of the Christ who suffered and died for his people by that new and living way which he has opened for you through his body into the holiest place made without hands. You can go closer than Asaph could. You can come to God and you can gaze upon him as he makes himself known in the Christ who is the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. And you can say with those disciples, or at least you can hear with those disciples as Christ says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. How do we get back on track? It is through worship in the presence of Almighty God. And to be among God's people, under God's word, singing God's praises, seeking God's face, hearing God's truth, responding to God's mercies and favours is the closest we get to heaven upon earth. And what was the consequence? Asaph had his vision blurred and his perspective skewed until he went into the sanctuary. So see the perspective that he gained. Then I understood their end. Asaph needed to learn to take the long view. Everything was getting too close. You ever done that thing, you, you know, if you put your hands here, you can just, depending on how good your eyesight is, you might need to go over here or up here, I don't know, but if you can go here, everything behind you just blurs, doesn't it? When something's up close and you're focused on that, you can't see much further than it. And God says, in effect, Asaph, you need to raise your eyes. Let the things that are close to you fade. Let the things that are close to you blur out of perspective. And look now at the things that lie ahead. You need to broaden your horizons, Asaph. You need to extend your view. You need to look beyond this life. 
You need to gaze beyond the things of this passing world. You need to understand the end of those whom you are tempted to envy. You look at them now and you see their wealth and their pleasure, their ease and their fortune, their beauty and their glory which is passing away. You see the peace which they boast to have. You see the joy which they say they possess. And you need to understand, Asaph, that even here it can so be, be so much of a sham. How much more when they come to the end? Surely you set them in slippery places. You think you want to get up high. You understand how far you can fall from there? You cast them down to destruction. Oh, how they are brought to desolation as in a moment. They are utterly consumed with terrors. You don't need to read many obituaries of the people that the world has celebrated to read in essence that description spun out so often as almost a desperate attempt to make sense of a life reaching for the stars and falling down into the pit. You can read it today. You'll be able to read it tomorrow. As a dream when one awakes, so, Lord, when you awake, you shall despise their image. Asaph needs to remember that there is an afterward. Asaph needs to understand that this is not everything. This is less real than the unseen reality. This is more than temporal failures. This isn't just that the things that they've rested on aren't going to work out quite as well as they'd hoped. Remember how the Apostle Paul speaks in 2 Corinthians in chapter 5. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That's where Asaph's going. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. And when he comes into the sanctuary of God, when the holiness and the glory and the goodness and the righteousness and the justice and the mercy of the ever-living God are set before him. Asaph is transported forward to the day when everyone stands before the judgment seat of this God to receive the reward, the consequences of what they have done in the body. There will come a point at which you, at which I, Every man, woman, boy and girl in this world will come before the judgment seat of God. It is appointed for man once to die and afterward the judgment. And then there's a day of resurrection coming. A resurrection to condemnation as well as a resurrection to life. Heaven and hell hang in the balance. And Asaph says, those people who seem to have it so easy, those who seem to have it made, those who are living for and grasping after and seeming to get all the good things that this world says are worth having, they are going to come to judgment without a saviour. They're going to come to judgment without a sacrifice. They're going to come before the God of all the earth, uncovered, unforgiven. They seem to have such a bright day, but the night will fall suddenly and will end with a terrible and enduring darkness unless they too come to understand 
that there is forgiveness with God, that there is peace and plenty that rises above anything that this world has to offer, that there is happiness and joy that is sweet and substantial, that there is forgiveness of sins through the blood of the Lamb, that there is peace with God on account of Jesus Christ. Where will they go? What will they take? How will they suffer? But don't we need to bring it closer to home? Where will you go? What will you take? It's a platitude with us all. You can't take it with you when you go, you know. My friends, we cannot take it with us when we go. There's only one thing that will survive the grave. It's the God-given robe of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. What did Job say? Naked I came, and naked I go. One of the richest, if not the richest men of the East in his day. And what did Job understand? As the things of this world began to strip away from him, or be stripped away from him, I came with nothing, I will go with nothing. All that will matter in that day will be my standing with God. And my standing with God stands or falls on my relationship to Jesus Christ. Without him, we will go to hell. Without him, even the things which we have craved and desired and pursued in this world will be utterly taken away. And the bitterness and the ugliness and the emptiness and the misery and the regret and the bitterness will be part of what poisons our soul as the worm gnaws at our conscience. The fiery judgment of those who have lived for this world and died without Jesus Christ. But if you're a Christian, you have a saviour. For you there is an afterward. Thus my heart was grieved and I was vexed in my mind. I was so foolish and ignorant, I was like a beast before you. I'd started thinking like a creature of dust who'd forgotten that they have a soul that will never die. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. What mercy, what kindness that when our minds are drifting from God, God does not allow us to drift too far. You hold me by my right hand. You will guide me with your counsel and afterward receive me to glory. Asaph saying, what are you bothered about? What are you obsessing over? What are you yearning for? He is, to use a phrase from Lloyd-Jones, he stopped listening to himself when he started talking to himself. Asaph, have you understood what's at stake here? Here you are grasping after the passing things of this world. It's all going to fall apart and be swept away. And only the unshaken and unshakable kingdom of God will stand. You have your God Asaph, you have him who makes himself known in the sanctuary. Your God, your portion, your shield, your exceeding great reward. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And Asaph says, now stop your complaining. Stop your coveting. Stop your envying. Stop your grasping. Look at the world, not as the world feels itself to be, but as it really is. Put on, O oh God, O oh Asaph, the spectacles of the sanctuary. Get your, your lines clear. Get your perspective 
right. Start measuring by the right line. Start weighing on the right scales. Start counting with the right values. Get the right answers because you're asking the right questions. And the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. I'm not preaching this because I've had a whisper from either of your pastors that you're a congregation riven by envies and complainings. I'm preaching this because the world shouts at us, calls to us, lures us and allures us, assaults us, batters us with the values of time, blinds us to the things of eternity. I'm preaching this because you and I, like Asaph, need to go into the sanctuary of God. That's where we anchor our souls. That's where we reset our perspectives. That's where God in his mercy says to us in effect, Oh, my son, my daughter, lift up your eyes and see. Take the long view. Fix your focus, not upon the things that are close at hand, but the things that are still afar off. And go that way. Fix your gaze on the celestial city. Walk as a pilgrim toward heaven. Live conscious of the fact that a day of reckoning is drawing near, that the judgment of God is at hand, and that the Christ of God will soon come in his glory with his holy angels to sit on the throne of his glory. And that's the day when the things that are true and real and good and sweet and sure and eternal will really matter. The things that the world values will be utterly emptied of value in that day. The platform upon which the great ones of the world stand will crumple to nothing and be swept out from underneath their feet in that day. When men like Paul the Apostle talk about not being ashamed, they mean they've got something that will stand in that day. The carpet's not going to be pulled out from underneath them. The staff on which they lean is not going to crumple under them. The Christ to whom they cling will not disappoint them or be ashamed of them. Live conscious of the judgment. Anchor your soul on the eternal God in his glory and majesty and beauty. The glory of heaven lies ahead for those who know him. The gloom and the horror of hell is reserved for those who live only for this life and take no thought of the world which is to come. There is an afterward, brother, sister. And for those who know Christ, it is the glory which is to come. Amen. Let's close in prayer. Lord God, this life is short. It is uncertain. At its best, apart from you, it is unsatisfying. We were not made to fill our souls with the passing pleasures of the present evil age. We will never find satisfaction and stability with the things that pass away for a soul that is made for something purer and higher. Oh God, we were made to find our joy and peace in you. How can we imagine that we would find joy and peace apart from you? Oh God, for your glory's sake, show us more of yourself. Show us more of Christ Jesus that we might know you in him. By your spirit, open our eyes that we might look higher 
We might look further, that we might see what lies ahead. Bring us, O God, again and again into your sanctuary, that our souls may be stabilized and settled, anchored upon the truth, that we might put on the the spectacles which give us a heavenly vision, that we might look through that perspective glass, that telescope, at the things which lie far in the distance for the pilgrim on the way, but towards which we are pressing, and which will make every sacrifice, every investment, every battle of this present world worthwhile if it is fought for Christ. Oh God, in your mercy, teach us these things. Help us as your people to keep our eyes fixed upon you. And so to you who is able to keep us from stumbling and to present us faultless before the presence of your glory with exceeding joy, to God our Saviour, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen.